collapse. Uh, start to recapture where we left in the previous class, and we started looking at specifications of tokens. And we then picked up a small language for which we were trying to construct a set of diagrams, which I started calling the transition diagram. And please do not confuse them with finite state machine, because in transition diagram, we are looking at the implementation details. And this was the language we had. And we said that we are going to now construct an analyzer which is going to return finally a token and attribute pair. So token is going to be like it could be a relational operation like this and so on. And attribute is going to be which relation operation which is the lexi and in case of number it will be the number. And then as we were discussing this we made a transition diagram for greater than equal and greater than and we just get the start state from where we said if I see the greater than symbol then I move to another state and then I can either see an equal or other and then in this particular state I was returning a character back into the input state. And once we did this then we also started constructing the transition diagram which could so which could capture the whole of relational operations which is all the six operators here and this transition diagram consisted of many more final states, in fact six because we have six lexemes here and in some of the lexemes we have a return here. So a thumb rule to remember is that whenever you reach a final state with something which is not part of the token with a label other, then you tend to return that character back into the input. Okay. So this is where we stopped in the previous class. Any questions or comments or doubts you have before I move on? Was this clear to everyone? Okay. So let's take a little more complex <coughs> things. So then we looked at identifier. This also I think I'm not sure whether we discussed. So let's look at this. So in start state, you first look at the letter. And in this state, you are only going to look at either a letter or a digit. Because our specification said that we will consist or we will define an identifier which consists only of, so let's look at these specifications first. Okay? So our specifications are we have a set of relational operations, then we have an identifier which consists of letter followed by zero or more occurrences of letter or digit. And then we have a number which consists of at least one digit. And then we have a fraction part. And if we have a fraction part, either fraction part is completely missing, which is optional, which is given by this question mark. But if it is not completely missing, then it must have at least a dot and at least one digit. So I rule out all numbers like one point. Okay? I must have at least one digit coming after dot. And then I have either the exponent. Now exponent is either completely missing or is not there. But if it is there, then I have a letter E here. And then I have an optional sign, which is either a plus or minus, so even plus or minus could be missing and then followed by at least one digit. Okay? So these are my specifications and my delimiter, delimiters were either blank, tab or a new line and the white space is nothing but one or more delimiter. Right? This is what my specifications are. Okay? So we looked at how to construct a finite, uh, how to construct a transition diagram for relational operations and then we have to see that how do I construct transition diagram for rest of the specifications and then go for implementation of these transition diagrams. Okay, that is the task in front of us. Okay. So this is the transition diagram for relational operation. And then what we have is a transition diagram for identifier. So I first see a letter, then I reach another state. And in this state, I can see any number of letters or digits. And if I see something else, then I exit reach a final state, which gives me a recognition of identifier. But it also says that I must return the last character back into the input state. And then we are looking at transition diagram for white spaces. So this is really simple. I must see at least one delimiter. And then I can see more delimiters because I can have any number of blanks here. And when I see something else, then I reach a final state. Okay? And I return the last character red in, back into the input state. So these are my specifications. Let's look at now numbers. Okay? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually construct multiple transition diagrams for numbers. Okay? And how do these look? How do they look? So in the start state, okay, no matter if I'm looking at number, I must see a digit. Okay? 
So this is what we really do, that I actually see a digit that's passed. Now depending upon whether this is an integer or this is a real number, which means it has a fraction part, I will either see a dot or I will not see a dot. Right? So, but before I reach that state, it is possible that I will have more than one digit here. Okay? So in this state, I say that I can loop on digit and I can see any number of digits. And how do I exit from this? So if it's a real number, then I can only way I can exit is by looking at dot. Okay? But there is another way I can exit from this because fraction part may be missing. That's the optional part, and I will directly see an exponent part. So I can have something like this: one e ten. That is possible, right? So what I do here is so let's leave this part aside for the time being, and let's see that if I have seen a dot, then I must see at least one digit. So this is what at least one digit gives me. I reach this state, and in this state, I can see more digits. Okay, so I must, I can actually loop on digit in this particular state. <coughs> now, once I have exhausted all, so if I look at now, let's say, something like this. Okay, so by this specification, what I have exhausted is everything up to 6. <laughs> so in the start state, I will see 1. And then in the next state, I will see 2 and 3. I will loop on that state. Then I will see the dot. And then 4 will be <coughs> to this state. And then 5 and 6 will loop on this. Right? And then in this state now, either I can see an E here, which means I am looking at this. Or I can see an E here, because this part was <coughs> completely optional. Okay? So in this state, I can either see an E and reach this state or I can see an E and reach this state. And if I reach this state, then what do I see from my specifications? I can either see a plus or minus or that is optional, I can see a digit. Okay? So this is what may happen that I may see a plus or minus, but I may see a digit after plus or minus or I may see a digit immediately after E. Right? So I am looking at situation where I say that I can either have 1e e plus 10 or I can have 1e e minus 10 or I can have 1e e 10 which in this case is by default same as plus. Okay, that, that's the interpretation. So I have reached this state. Okay. Now I am not going to count okay, and therefore I will say that I will keep looking at more and more digits here. Okay. And when will I come out? When I will see something else. So when I see something else, I reach the final state and in this final state I return the last character back to the history. What I have not written here and which is going to be part of the code is going to be construction of the number. So if you recall the code I wrote in C, when I said when you read a digit, then how do you construct the number? You keep on reading more and more digits, keep on multiplying whatever you have seen by so far by 10 and keep on adding it. Right? So if I see 1, I will take the ASCII value of 1 and subtract as key value of 0 from this, which will give me 1. And when I see 2, I multiply 1 by 10 and add difference of this character 2 with as key 0 and so on. So that way I can construct this number. Okay? I mean, similarly, you can have the logic for the fraction part and for the exponent part. Okay? That's no big deal. Okay? So this is one transition diagram you see for unsigned numbers. Okay? Let's look at other kind of transition diagram. Okay? And now, suppose I just consider situations like this. I do not have an exponent part. Okay? So what is going to happen? Okay? I can, so this is only going to be a sub diagram, so I will not go through the detailed application, but you can see that here I have the left hand side of the number and here I have the fraction part and then I will exit when I see something else. So this will be captured. So this is actually going to capture real numbers which do not have exponent part. This captures real numbers which have an exponent part. And then I can also look at just the integers. And just the integers are going to capture something like this. It will not have either a fraction or are not going to have exponent part. And then in this case, when I see others, I will reach the final state. And then I will return the last character back into the input state. Right? So this is a possible set of transition diagrams for capturing all possible numbers. Now I have a little problem, and that little problem is 
that I have three transition diagrams which have start state and I have a number. So suppose I want to now say that I want to tokenize this number. Okay? Now which start state I should start with? Because these are all corresponding to the number and if I just treat the first digit, that doesn't tell me what is going to follow. Okay? Whether this is a real number without an exponent or whether it is an integer or whether this is a real number exponent. So I have various combinations okay? and just by looking at the first digit, I cannot make out what should be my start state. So what should I do? So suppose I am trying to recognize and I have seen this thing. What should be my start state? Should it be this, this or this? So one one strategy <coughs> that is being suggested is that I should prioritize my rules. Okay, I should give priority to some of the rules, and then if it does not succeed, then I should go to another rule. Right? Is that what you suggested? Now, what should be my order in which I give priority? Integer. Okay. So, how do I figure that out? So, suppose I am trying to pass or I am trying to tokenize this particular string and I say I give priority to integer. So, I reach here and I will consume 1, 2 and 3 and then I will see a dot and I say I have reached the final string. So, what happens? Is that correct? No, because then you say I have tokenized this part and this is the beginning of another token because this will be returned into the input stream and then it will try to construct another token starting with this which is obviously will give me an error and then I say sorry your input is incorrect. Right? So that priority order that integer comes first is not correct. Now remember that we were using maximal merge principle. Now by using that principle which is the transition diagram which is going to consume the maximum input first one obviously, right? so that should be my order. Okay? So what we should do is, we should prioritize these rules, but we should not reach our final fail state unless I have tried all the rules. So let's look at that scenario. Suppose I have, so I will give you three scenarios. This is one of the inputs I have, this is another input and this is the <coughs> third input. Okay? So let me call them. A, let me call this B and let me call this C. Okay. Now let's see what happens in these three cases. Okay. So when I try to tokenize this, it will actually fit here okay, and will reach final state and will say this is the token. Okay. But now suppose I try to tokenize this by look, looking at the first diagram because that is my highest priority. Okay. So this will consume 1, this will consume 2, 3, this will consume dot, this will consume 4, this will consume 5 and now what happens? I am expecting an E here, okay? but there is no E. Okay? So I say this is an error. Okay? But is this really an error? So I will say no, this is my second transition diagram, let us try this. Okay? And when I try this, I will successfully reach a final state saying that this can now be tokenized. Okay? What about 123? 123 will take me through these states, 1, 2 and 3 and then say I am expecting a dot or E and I cannot go beyond this. So this obviously is not the correct transition diagram, then I come to this, so I look at 1, 2 and 3 and I am expecting a dot, again I am stuck, then I say let us try this one, I will try 1, 2 and 3 and then I will reach the final state, right, so that seems to work. So if I prioritize my rules, okay, then I will be able to decide, does not matter which input I choose, I can just go over this first, this first and this first and only if all the transition diagrams reach the fail state, one after another in this priority order, then I will say that I am not able to tokenize this particular input. Sir, then only I reach a fail state. Yeah. Sir, instead of making, uh, instead of having a transition diagram with only one final state, why do not we make a transition diagram having multiple final states so that we do not have to uh, check it again and again, whether this is the first case, the second case or the third case. Okay. So how do I do that? 
after three, there is no dot or no e. Just so which transition diagram we talking about? First, I'm talking first, about the first. First, okay. After reading one to three, okay. if there is mm. anything other than dot and e, mm. and take it to some final state and make it integer. Very good. End it there. Yes. And if there is dot, then take it further. Or or if uh, there is e, <coughs> take it further and then again make. So you are saying somehow merge all these things into the same transition yeah. diagram. Right. Okay. So one observation is that I am unnecessarily trying out <coughs> multiple transition diagrams. I should somehow have a transition diagram where everything will be part of the specification. And then when I consume one here and two, three here, and I don't see a dot or e, and I see something else, that should immediately jump to a final state. Is that what your observation is? Okay. Anyone has an answer why I didn't do that? Because float and integer are handled differently. Hmm. When we are trying to convert hmm. this into a, a number, hmm. the floating point number would be handled differently, like add integers would be handled differently. Sure. So, what is the problem with that? Like, if we start uh, assuming that the number would be a floating point number. No, we don't start with by any assumption. <coughs> so, uh, but that will be decided by the final state. So, maximum run principle will not be followed. Why? So if I look at this, so look at this, I mean what was suggested, if I say this consumes 1, this consumes 2, 3, then I am expecting a dot or e and if I say others, okay, suppose I have an edge others, which will take me say finally here, then even this is captured by the same transition diagram without an error. We should have three different final states, one saying that this is integer. So, okay, fair enough. So if I say here, that will take me to a final state here. Okay. If I say other, so instead of going on this edge or this edge, I will come to that. Okay. Which is amounting to the same thing. All I am saying is that I am now returning an integer. Okay. So why didn't I do that? So programmatically, what I do is uh, specific, uh, give the specifications. Mm -hmm. So sir, uh, uh, it would be a very difficult job, job to figure out what are the common parts between different specifications and merge. So let me delay answer. So think about it. Let me delay this answer for five minutes and then we will come back to this. Okay. First let's see how do I implement this. Okay. Because we are talking about implementation and what I have seen here are specifications. Okay. So how do I implement this? Okay. So okay. So this is this file actually captures we have already discussed. So let's see for a given token must be the longest possible and assume this input 1.12.34 one, uh, one, uh, exponent 5.6. And starting from third diagram, we'll accept state which reaches final state after one two, which is clearly wrong, and therefore matching should always start with the first transition diagram, which in fact in this case was the longest. And if a failure occurs in one transition diagram, then retract and then forward pointer to the start state and activate the next transition diagram. This is what we were doing. This is what we discussed. And if a failure occurs in all diagrams, then a lexical error is occurred. Otherwise, I'll move on. Right. So this is what I just discussed by way of having these examples. Okay. So how do I implement these transition diagrams? I can just have a switch statement, <coughs> very simple implementation. And all we are saying is that when I look at the next token, which is the function of type token, and I can go into an infinite loop, I can keep on reading characters. And all I need to do is look at the state, look at the input character, and then decide what is my next state. Okay. And in between, I do bookkeeping too convert that into certain numbers. Okay? So this is what happens if I am in some state 10. Okay? I have assumed certain state. If I am in some state 10, then what do I do? I read the character and if this character is a letter, then I say state remains 10. If it is a digit, then state remains 10. Otherwise, this is state 11. And then I break. So what transition diagram is being captured by this code? Which transition diagram I'm capturing here? This is identified, right? So this is saying that I'm in such certain state. I read, and if it is a letter or digit, I remain in the same state. Okay, and then if it is something else, then I move into this, and then I break. And you can put up all the bookkeeping information like how you are constructing a lexeme and how you are returning a character back into the input stream and so on. Okay? But basically, this remains the skeleton of the activities you are doing. So it's very easy to take a set of transition diagrams and just convert them into a piece of C code. So remember, we talked about three implementation strategies. 
one implementation strategy was where we write regular expressions and let some tool do the generation of lexical analyzer. Second we said was going to be where I am going to write certain specifications and in a systematic manner I am going to convert that into low level C code. And third was that I am going to use some kind of low level coding for I. Okay, where I is going to be done by assembly language so that it can be faster. Now that will be no different than this because the only thing that will happen is that when I talk about next character and so on which is actually a read statement that time I am going to use some kind of assembly language because that is going to further improve at least speed of my code <coughs> not readable quality. Right, so all transition diagrams can be easily converted into something like this and now coming back to the question which was raised saying why don't I merge. Okay? So here is actually merging. In this state I can see others, I can reach here. In this state I can also see others and if I add few more edges then you are able to comprehend it. Okay? And this will capture, single transition diagram is going to capture all numbers successfully. Okay? Only problem is that when I start converting this transition diagram into a code, the more complex transition diagram you have, the more complex your code is going to be. Because at every state you will have to make multiple decisions. Okay? Now the choice is there is a trade-off. And the trade-off is you want to have a complex transition diagram and therefore complex code and therefore probability of introducing errors or a set of simple transition diagrams and then simple code and hoping that you will not introduce an error. Because here remember that we are talking about systematically writing C code. We don't have a tool which is going to make sure that I just write a transition diagram or I just take some kind of regular expressions and convert them into C code. Okay? So trade-off really is that how complex transition diagram you can afford to have. Now if I start merging everything into a single transition diagram, perhaps it will become very complex. But there is no measure where I can say that this is too complex and this is the boundary beyond which you should not go. It's really a judgment the programmer has to make. So if I take this transition diagram, it doesn't look full lot complex than what we had earlier. Okay? But some, some transition diagrams when we start merging can get very complex and therefore we don't want to increase the complexity. So that's a trade off. You can have, so both the approaches are fine. You have to make a judgment that which is less error prone and therefore convert that into a piece of code. So, yeah. so you mentioned the switch case approach for uh, uh, That is one way of writing. So, but like if we have to uh, use multiple transition diagrams, where will, we, uh, where will we get the previous characters that have been lost in the... So you will have to, if you have multiple transition yes, diagrams, so you will have to remember the pointer, <coughs> right? That you say that corresponding to numbers, I have five transition diagrams and this is my start state. So if it is reading, reaching the fail state, then I say that if 10 is the start state, 11 is the start state, 12 is the start state of the numbers, then after reaching the failure state, jump to 12 or jump to 13 and then only fail. So, little more nesting of the code. Uh, the input, we don't get it back. Uh, store. No, the question is not clear to me, sorry. So, the input, the characters that we are reading one by one, mm -hmm. so they get lost every time? Uh, they don't get lost, right? You only have to move your input back, pointer back. See, it's an additional bookkeeping. And nothing is getting lost anywhere, right? So when you say I have multiple transition diagram, I can have one more pointer to the input and say that this pointer, this will, pointer will remain there. So. Right? so only catch here is that why did I have not this transition diagram earlier? This was the point I wanted to bring out that I can have both the specifications, both can be implemented. You have to make a choice which one is more complex and which one is easier, easier to implement. That's the only thing. This is like saying that if, if I ask you to code something, if I ask you to solve a problem, <coughs> you can write hundreds of programs which will give me the same solution. Or which one is right? All of them may be right. Which one is easy to debug, which one is readable and so on, that's a subjective thing. So is this point clear to everyone? Okay. So let's then move on okay. and let's see that the third approach, okay, so this is, we said specifications first and then I said from specifications how do I design trans transition diagrams and then how do I convert those transition diagrams into directly C code. Okay? 
But suppose I don't want to go through that route, then what do I do? Okay. I am going to then use lexical analyzer generators and you already know a lexical analyzer generator which is lex. Okay. This you have done in CS251. Right. Everyone remembers that. Okay. In fact, your TAs have already sent you the user's manual for both lex and get. So, input to the generator is a list of regular expressions in certain priority order. And priority order is again going to be very important. Okay. And then we have some sort of action which is associated with each of the regular expressions, okay, which says that what kind of <coughs> token has to be generated and what kind of bookkeeping has to be done. Okay. And once that is done, what is my output? Output is a program that is going to then read. So, output is a C program which you again compile. So, if you are talking about lex, then output is going to be lex.yy.c, which are going to again write a small main function and you are going to call that function lex.yy.c and then compile it. Okay? And this is going to then break your input into a set of tokens and is also going to report all the errors. Okay? So, if I look at diagrammatically, this is how it looks that lex takes a set of inputs, which is token specification, <coughs> gives me lex.yy.c which is the code for lexical analyzer and then I have the native C compiler which is going to give me object code and this really is the lexical analyzer which takes my input and gives me a set of tokens, right? And this you have already done. So, same thing you are going to do for programming languages. Clear? Okay. So, for more details, just look at the lex map. Okay. I am not going to discuss lex once again here. So, if you do not remember something, otherwise I mean I will expect that there is something you remember. The key things to remember in lex is most of the things, see lex has lot of function calls and gives you lot of functionality, but if you remember the very few things, most of the time functionally you can write correct programs. Okay. They may not be very efficient, but they will be at least functionally correct. Okay. Things you will have to remember is at some point of time you need to capture the lexeme. Okay. And how do you capture the lexeme in lex? What is the function for that? There is an array called yy text, right? So, yy text will tell you what is the string which has been matched by a token, and yy length will give you the length of that. And only one additional feature which is going to be useful is the look ahead. So, if you are looking at context, if you recall a slash b, it says that match a only if it occurs as a prefix of b, right? So, if you remember these two, three things, and then yy in, yy in is another function that helps you in inputting and that will tell you how to do the buffer management over your input. Okay. So, if you just remember these few things, four or five things, you will at least be able to write functionally correct program and I am assuming that you at least know your regular expression so that you can write specifications correctly. So, you do not need to know lot of things about lex, okay. just this will work. Now, another thing okay, you should always do is look at this file lex.yy.c and open it using whatever editor you use and search for a string called debug. If you search for a string for debug, most likely this is going to be LL debug, which is set to by hash define is set to 0. Okay. Change that to 1 and suddenly you will find that when you start running this program, it will give you a lot of debugging information. So, both in lex and in get, if you set the debug switch to 1 okay, or this variable to 1, then you will get lot of debugging information which will help you in debugging your input. Okay. So, just go through this code once, okay. code is not very difficult, look at the few variables and then you will be very efficient with or very comfortable with lex code. But advice is not to change the lex code or this generated code to manipulate certain tokens. All the time you should try to manipulate your specifications and not manipulate the code unless you want to debug something. In production mode, it is a bad idea that you first generate some code, then go and modify that code because next time you try to modify it, it will not work at all. Okay. In fact, I mean we want to focus at this part and not modification. Sir, you said debug variables took two or something? It is true or false, right? So, I do not know whether we have tertiary logic, you know, my logic. <laughs> So, if you set it to any number other than 0, it will still be true. Okay. 0 is false, any other number is not 0. Is. Okay. So, how does lex work? Okay. Lex again, this is just to recapture about functionality of lex and to capture about what you did in theory of computation when you are trying to construct 
finite state machines form regular expressions. Basically, what it does is it takes regular expressions which describe the language and which can be recognized by a certain finite state machine, and this types are standard really. That what we construct is first a non-deterministic finite state machine or finite state automata, and then convert this into an equivalent DFA, and then to minimize DFA to reduce number of sticks. Okay, and this part again you must have done as part of your theory of totality <coughs> course. And again, if you have forgotten it, it is good to know about the tool internals of the tool you are trying to use. So these are the really steps which are largely logically involved. Okay? Code may not look like p functions like this. Code may be all merged into each other, but logically this is what it does. Okay, and the code is driven code is emitted as DFA table. So again, if you look at lex dot yy dot c, you'll find a large table there which is being used. Okay, table is nothing but a finite <coughs> expression. Okay, it is telling you that if this is my state and this is my input, then what should be the next state and so on. And that's it. Okay, so this is all about lexical analyzer I want to discuss. So if you have questions, we can discuss those questions here. Otherwise, we are going to move on to the next phase of so is lexical analyzer clear to everyone? Yes, no. Yes. So second February is the deadline your TAs have given for writing lexical analyzer for whatever tool you have, right? Second February is the deadline. <coughs> so today is uh, what is the date today? Twenty second. So yeah, ten days. So we have comfortable time. In fact, I mean you should be able to finish it much earlier. My suggestion will be that don't start saying that, oh, I have 10 days and therefore I'll start working on 30th night and finish everything by 31st night. And as usual, everything will work, so no problem, and submit second will be able to submit. Because those are the queries TAs and I are going to get around first, saying why I don't understand this. Okay? Obviously, for next 10 days, if you don't work, you will not understand it. My suggestion will be start now. You know everything about lexical analyzer and finish it in two days. Okay? And once you are finished, just forget about it. Review it one day before the submission and that will work fine. But if you start coding on 31st or 30th, okay, most likely you will not be able to finish your lexical analyzer by second. Okay? So this last lap of marathon kind of situation, avoid that. Okay? I'm hoping that you will run very fast in last 100 meters and win, win the marathon. That usually does not happen. You have to run at a constant speed if you really want to finish it. Successful. Sir, yeah. how much do we need to learn about the language for this data compiler? How much do you need to learn about the language? Now, this is a very loaded question. Okay? So, when you say that I want to learn about the language, okay, what do we mean by saying that learn about the language? So, I can interpret this question in several ways. That if I'm trying to learn English, okay, then I want to learn about how to write a good essay in English. Okay? Or I can say I don't care about that, I just need a dictionary and I need a vocabulary. Okay? So if you are saying that I want to suppose a language called data, okay? or a language called chill, or a language called XYZ, okay? I don't have to start coding in that language to write a compiler. All I need to do is I need to look at the specifications of that language and see that how can I tokenize strings in this particular language. That's the only thing I need to do and nothing else. So if I cannot write a program in that language, that is fine as long as I understand it. Okay? In fact, now my suggestion will be, uh, which is the first language you learned, C or Java? C. C. And what was the book you used? Karnigan and Nishi. Very good. And uh, how many sections and chapters does it have? So go back once again, open Karnigan and Nishi, and you'll find that somewhere in the middle, it says reference manual. And the first part says programming in C, but the second part will say C reference manual. C reference manual is the part you need to learn, which will say how to tokenize, how to get the grammar, what is the semantics. And the first part which says how to write programs in C, you can forget about that. And that is true of all languages. So look at the reference manual and not user's manual. Okay? Because you are only looking at references and nothing else. So if you say that I am writing, say, a compiler for Fortran, then if I cannot code in Fortran, that is okay, as long as you know what are the specifications of Fortran. Only thing, only language you need to learn is the language in which you are coding your compiler. That you need to know that. Okay. Any other questions?
So everyone is now okay. So another question I think we did not meet after that announcement that everyone is now comfortable with their group and they have understood each other and no, there's still fights going on. So all those who have fights and disputes with your team partners, please meet me tomorrow then. So that I can resolve them so that we can be productive as fast as possible. So that's my job. So you have to come and tell me that why you are not able to work together. Because by and large, by and large, not always, I have gone by your choices. So I'm sure, I mean, some people have not got their choices, but at least you have one member in the team which you choose, right? And in most cases, you have other team which was one of your choices, may not have been the first choice, the first choice, but at least you chose. So if you still have some problems in working as a team, you have to come and discuss it now, rather than on 16th of April standing on the dais and saying, this guy didn't work, I worked, and he was not done. <laughs> that will be a really bad situation for all of you. I have seen these kind of things happening in the past. So I am just talking from experience and saying, let's try to resolve those problems now rather than at the final level. Okay? So shall we move on to the next topic? If you have no other questions and so on. Alright, so what was the next phase of compiler? What was the next phase of compiler? Parser. Okay, so good. So let's move on to parser. So this is what we want to learn now and in the first point, I am just going to capture the functional specifications of what a parser does. This is input to my parser, my input has already been tokenized, so I no longer have characters but what I have are a string of tokens or words if you want to call it. So now I have this if and left parenthesis and an identifier b and an equal sign being compared b is being compared to 0 and then I have a right parenthesis and a is being assigned b and semicolon and output of my parser is going to be that I am going to convert this into an abstract syntax tree okay and I also want to do error reporting that means I want to say that if this string of tokens does not conform to the grammar I have for the language then I want to flag an error. At the same time, I just don't want to exit off flagging an error, but I want to recover from this situation and flag as many errors as possible in the process of parsing. So I want to recover and we talk about strategies for recovery and for error reporting. How I am going to model this, I am going to talk about context-free grammars, I am going to use context-free grammars for parsing. And you know that, how do you recognize context-free grammars? We are going to talk about push down automata and table driven parsing. Push down automata are going to be implemented using table driven parsing. So, this is really what we are going to talk about in the next five lectures or so. Okay? We will talk about theory of parsing. So, but this point actually captures the complete functionality of what my parser is going to do. And what I am going to now capture in the rest of the lectures is how I am going to do it. Okay? Now, before I get into these details of Passing, okay. let's also understand what this cannot do. Okay. So if you see here, parser is sitting somewhere in the middle of a process of compilation and here what I have is lexical analyzer. This is what my input is. This is where my parser sits and this is where my type checker sits. And then I have further information. Okay. Now two things you must understand. Okay. One, that this parser can do something, okay, but it cannot do what type checker is supposed to do. Okay. Also, what this parser can do, this phase was not able to do, and that's why we are doing it here. Okay. And it just needs to not only needs to check that my input is correct, but also needs to generate information for the rest of the phases. Okay. So just by saying that if I have a context-free grammar and I have specifications and this input does not conform to the context-free grammar specifications I have, then this is wrong input and then stop or says this is right input and then stop is not acceptable. It must generate enough information so that the phases which come later, they can do something more meaningful. They can do something at all. Okay? So first let's see what syntax analyzer cannot do. Okay? Now the kind of questions, okay, and this is a normal situation. Uh, kind of questions we say 
you have to check whether variable is of certain type okay, on which operations are allowed. So for example, if I say a plus b and if you say is this operation allowed on a and b, parser cannot determine that okay, because that will be saying that in which context this plus operator occurs. <coughs> that we will not be able to do here. Also, we will not be able to, for example, check things like whether this variable has been declared before I use it. Okay? So it will not be able to check whether A has been declared before I am using A. Okay? That is really not the job of this phase. That will be done subsequently. I will not be able to check, for example, whether this variable is initialized or not. Okay? So I will not be able to say whether this is undefined value okay? and therefore do not use it. That again, <coughs> Arthur will not be able to do. And all these issues are going to be handled subsequently. So basically, if you look at all these three points, in some way, they are talking about context information. Okay? This one is saying that in what context this particular variable occurs and this is also saying that this variable has been whether it is undefined or uninitialized variable and so on and this is talking about operators and so on. Okay? So basically whenever you see some contextual information, parser cannot handle the contextual information. Okay? And that is why we say that we are going to model this as context down. Okay? And also because we are saying that we want to do things here, <coughs> then obviously there were things you were not able to do here. Okay. Otherwise, I would have finished it in the lexical analyzer. So, what are the kind of things we want to do here, which you are not able to do here? Okay. Which can I can? So now you know that in the language hierarchy, why context-free grammars are more powerful than the regular expressions because they can do few things which regular expressions cannot. So, for example, they can count. I have no way of counting in a finite state machine or in a regular expression. So, if I want to say, do I have a balanced set of brackets? Okay. That regular expressions cannot do push down automata will be able to do it very easy. Okay. So if I try to capture <coughs> grammar, okay, this is a grammar which is, is a regular, which is not in regular, but this is obviously context free. So finite automata may repeat states, but it cannot remember the number of times it has repeated. Okay. That is the limitation. Okay. So we will have to move to something more powerful framework and more powerful framework is really the context we got. Okay. So you must know very clearly that I can do few things here and I can do few things here and I can do few things here. What I am doing here cannot be done here and what I am doing here, some of those things cannot be done here and they have to be moved to the type check. Okay. So this also brings me back to the overall model of compilation where we said that each phase is doing a logical activity, well defined logical activity. So that when I start debugging my compiler, I know that if I catch a kind of error, I know that where should I go? Should I go and debug this phase or debug this phase or debug this phase? Right? So this is a clean separation of jobs. Yes? So at least in the context of where parser sits in a compiler, you understand the two boundaries, what it cannot do and what it should not be doing. Okay? Now, you may also ask the question, can I take regular grammars? Are regular grammars a proper subset of this? Are they a subset of context-free grammars? So why do I have lexical analyzer? Can I just merge lexical analyzer with my parser? Why do I have two phases? Again, the reason is very simple. Okay? To do tokenization, context-free grammar is a more powerful machine than I really need. Okay? So if I can do something with less complexity, let me do it there. Okay? So this really is a less powerful machinery which is available to me. Let's try to tokenization. Okay? I don't want to use this for tokenization. Similarly, if I go to even more powerful mechanism and say that these are all subsets, capture everything here, okay? this, this phase will become very complex. Okay? So we are just trying to do logical activities and finish those activities in each other phase. So syntax definition, this is again, I am just recapturing which perhaps you already know from your theory of computation that context-free grammar as far as we are concerned, we are going to define context-free grammar as a consists of a set of tokens, a set of non-terminals. So I am not going to talk about all the formal definitions of context-free grammar and proofs and so on, but we straight away go into implementation and see that how I am going to specify languages using context-free grammars. That is why we do TOC before we do compilers. Okay? So you have a set of tokens which are terminal symbols, you have a set of non-terminal symbols 
and then you have a set of productions and the productions in context with gamma travel the form that left hand side is a non terminal and right hand side is a string of terminals and non terminals and then you have one of the non terminals as star symbol right this is what your gamma is so you have a four triple you have a set of terminals non terminals productions and a star symbol this is how you capture your context with gamma and then once i have the grammar then we say that this grammar actually derives strings by so this is really now you can see that right away i'm jumping into some kind of implementation so now we say that if there is some string which is specified by the this grammar or is in the language specified by this grammar then this can always be derived by starting with the star symbol now i'm not worried at this point of time about efficiency and so on so i can say that let's take the star symbol take all the productions which start with star symbol which have star symbol on the left and if i choose one of those productions and keep on replacing a non terminal on the right hand side by one of its production then what i get is a set of strings which can be derived by this particular star symbol and all such strings are going to be part of the language which are specified by this gram right this is what my definition is and in fact i mean this tells you that how i am going to do the recognition okay this in some way very neatly captures although may look very non descript kind of sentence this very neatly captures of what we are going to do to recognize something so what i will try to do is i will say take a string and see if i can derive it from the start symbol and if i can derive it from the start symbol then i i say that this is a valid string in this language and if i cannot derive it then i will say this is invalid right so strings which can be derived from the start symbol of the grammar g form the part of this language lg defined by the grammar right okay yeah. so let's look at just one example before we break for today and here is an example and there is a set of balanced parentheses so s derives s as a rule and how many rules do i have here i have two rules here one is saying that i have a bracketed expression followed by s or s can also derive epsilon <coughs> and my grammar is another this is another grammar <coughs> where i say that a list derives list plus digit or a list derives list minus digit or list just derives a digit okay and what is the language which is captured by this set of specifications these are all the digits this consists of expressions which have only two operators plus and minus and what are the operands uh, here only the single digits right okay and digits i can define by saying these are you know none okay so this consists of a language which is a list of digits which are separated by this plus and minus okay and this is really a set of balanced parentheses right so what we do in the next class we we'll start from this and see that given this kind of specifications so question now is going to be reverse okay i'll say i have these specifications i have some input and i try to see that whether this input belongs to the language specified by this particular gram okay so let's break here today and then we meet on thursday and please note down everyone note down i also send an email that on 27th and 2nd we have a special class so one and a half hour to catch up for the class Thank you.